Hey there, welcome to the channel. Hope you're having a great day. This is Studio Visitor, the place where we talk about care, philosophy and history. Uh, for this episode, I visited uh, Jeffrey of the Goose Mastering. Uh, Jeffrey is a legend in Holland if it comes to mastering with a career of 25 years. And we're talking about synesthesia, AI and some other things that might interest you. Let's not waste any more time. Let's get into it. My name is David Jones. I'm the Studio Visitor. This is yet another day, another story to tell. Next to me, the legendary Dutch master, <laughs> Jeffrey of the Goose Ma Music. How are you doing? Yeah, fine. Yeah. No complaints at all. No complaints so, at all. Yeah, it's uh, quite a busy week. Yeah. And uh, yeah, quite a lot of cool projects, like from piano music to punk to dance to all kinds of stuff which is pretty cool so yeah not complaining at all no i can yeah. imagine the diversity in uh you uh, can achieve is really trem tremendous huh? mm -hmm. yeah the, 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 the funny thing is that back then officially it was 1998 uh, when i started off with mastering it was 100 dance related and over the years it slowly grew into what it is right now and i think maybe like 10, 15% of all the music that I master is um, house, techno related stuff. And for the rest, it's it's all kinds of music. So it's it's slowly moved to other kinds of music. Okay. So But 25 years in the business, that's a long time. Basically, for yeah, yeah. The, the first paid mastering job was in 1998. Uh, fun fact, it was for IDNT back then. And uh, it was an album for a friend of mine uh, who was also contracted at IDNT back then. But the fun The fun fact is that that album was never released because <laughs> back then when the album was going to be released, they changed A&R managers and he had a different vision and things like that. So the album was already planned for being released. But then the new A&R manager came up and he was like, yeah, but I don't like this album. This album is not going to sell that well. So it was never released. So my first full album project <laughs> was... Unreleased. So, But, uh, what's your first job? Uh, a full album or just a single track? Uh, basically, the full album. Really? Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. Back then, uh, the, the the music scene was totally different because uh, back then you released it on vinyl. In the dance scene, it was just like you have a digital download now or a Spotify release. It was released on vinyl. That was the medium that yeah. that was used for DJs. So when you mastered something, it was for vinyl. Uh, which was also, I think, pretty good for me because uh, back then, same as now, uh, when you send out a master to a cutting engineer who is going to cut it on final, he's not going to cut it one on one. I pretty much insist on doing that because I know how masters for final should sound and yeah. what it should be done. But back then, I sent out masters and those masters were EQ'd, compressed, whatever he did to, the, to, the, to, to make it a good sounding record. But that was my luck, basically, because in the beginning I had no idea what I was doing. I was just turning knobs and I was like, yeah, it sounds better because it was louder, most likely. Uh, but for the rest, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just turning some knobs and I didn't have great monitoring. And But yeah. When, when you started, were you uh, taking part of the loudest war or...? No, that's funny because, uh, yeah, like I said, back then it was mostly final. And you had limiters, you had the, the, uh, the, what was it called, the Waves L1, I think it was, yeah, or the Waves L1, 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 whatever, L2. yeah. And um, you used it to tame just a tiny bit of the peaks, but it was never used for making it loud. It, it didn't exist the way it existed, like, I don't know, like early 20s. No, and really. like I said, in the beginning, it was mostly final. So, and later on, Uh, CDs came up and in, even then in the beginning it wasn't that loud. I think the real loudness war started in, I don't know, 2008 maybe? No, I don't know. Sooner, yeah. sooner, sooner. Maybe sooner, but not the way it was uh, like a couple of years ago at least. Uh, so. at, at some sort of point it was ridiculous how loud mastering uh, should be. Yeah. And uh, one of my previous ep episodes uh, uh, Someone, uh, Peter of Fine Tune Mastering said, you know, I don't want to go louder. This is the limit. It's, it's fine yeah, like this. Yeah, true. Uh, but uh, yeah, I just said that I uh, uh, finished the punk album last week or two weeks ago. Yeah. And 
The first master I did, it was pretty loud, but not over the top loud. But then I also did a version 2, which was not over the top loud, but way louder than you would expect. But that music simply asked for that loudness. It simply sounded better, not because it was louder, but the push and the sound and the feel of the compression and limiting simply worked better for that music because it had such impact. It, it needed to have that loudness, not yeah. because of the actual volume, the, 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 the lost value or something like that. No, it was the actual push that made it sound that good. If mastering punk, for, for instance, you, you mentioned now, uh, what kind of reference do you use? None. None? I just listen to the music, that's my reference. I just listen to what the music needs. I, I do have some reference tracks for myself, because sometimes, for some reason, I start up in the morning and I listen to something and it doesn't sound right. There is something missing, like I miss low end or I hear too much high end or whatever, it could be anything. I'm like, okay, what's going on here? And then I basically reset my ears by listening to those reference tracks for, I don't know, like half a minute or so. Yeah. And then I reset my ears, my brain, so that it evens out and I know how it should sound and, and what it should sound like. And for the rest, I just let the music speak. I just listen and I feel what is needed to a track. I'm like, okay, it needs to be more into this direction or this sounds good and this needs to be brought up more. This is a bit, little bit too much. Maybe that needs to be brought down a bit, but I'm not even thinking of what I'm doing. I'm just, I just listen and while I'm listening, I'm already making decisions. I try to make decisions, uh, the rough edges, so the rough, uh, rough sound of the master is usually done within, I don't know, like five or maybe 10 minutes. Really? I, otherwise, I would lose a bit of objectivity, I think, in my case. And I just make the rough sound. It's more like overall EQing, a bit of compression, things like that. And then I'm going to tune it more like, okay, now, um, I don't know, like it needs a bit of de-assing or maybe the snare needs to be brought up a bit more or it needs to be down a bit more, but then the overall sound is already made. So I try to make that as does fast it, as possible. Does to, it also to have to do, uh, you, you got a phenomenon air fatigue, but there's also a thing called brain fatigue where yeah. you're stuck yeah, into also, something. Yeah, in my case, it also works a bit different. A couple of years ago, I found an article online about synesthesia, synesthesia which is that you experience, uh, in my case, music, I always call it four dimensional. So it's not like I just hear music and I hear frequencies or things like that. I hear music in colors, shapes, I smell music. I, I just, it's, it's four dimensional. It's hard to explain how it works, but uh, without even realizing it, I was already making use of that uh, by feeling what the music needs. And after I read that article, I was like, okay, so this is synesthesia. This is not something that everybody has. Because I was like, yeah, everybody experiences music that way. But it was, yeah, what I understood, something special, whatever you call yeah. it. And um, so I read some articles and things, and I posted something funny enough on my Facebook. And then another Finnish mastering engineer came to me. He's like, okay, I have the same thing. So I always make use of it as well, like listening to it and feeling it, like what it needs to be, like with colors and things like that. And a few months later, he sent me a message like, okay, um, I was being interviewed for a Finnish magazine about synesthesia, but they wanted someone else uh, to be interviewed as well. So he brought me into contact with the, the yeah, magazine or whatever it was. And so I was interviewed, but because I had really specific questions, I was like, okay, yeah, now that I think of it, I really make use of it and I do it this way and that way. And Can, yeah. you, can you describe uh, how, uh, how it affects you uh, or uh, how you make decisions? Do you close your eyes? Do you see colors? No, no, it's, it's hard. Uh, if I really pay attention to it, the, the, the feeling goes away. So that's what... Yeah, it, it, it's still there, but it's not as, it's, yeah, it's really, it's, it's really hard to explain, but it's just like I, I put the music on and instantly or within a few seconds, I feel like, okay, this is what the music is about and this is the direction it needs to go. And that's why I, I always use the same equipment, the same plugins and things like that, because then I know inside out what to do. I have a, uh, an image in my head like, okay, it needs to sound this way and I don't want to think about, okay, 
uh, this EQ, how does this EQ work? What frequency shall I boost or cut or what shall I do? Without thinking about it, I just do it just like when you play music, you don't think about, okay, I'm going to hit a C now or that or that, or you don't think about it, Intuition you just do. Intuition is a big part. Sorry? Intuition. Intuition, is yeah. Yeah, but that's what I always think is funny when I do lectures. Um, students are always like, yeah, what kind of frequency is this? And what number should this be? And they all think about numbers and things like that. Then you should be a bookkeeper. You should not be... Um, an engineer. Not be an engineer, but an engineer is also technical. I think, I think mastering is not about engineering, at least not no. the sound part. It's about shaping the sound to make it sound as good as possible. Polishing. Yeah, but not about numbers and values and things like that. That's just when you a byproduct. When, when you're talking about numbers, uh, when you uh, uh, get a job, do you uh, aim for a specific number like LUFS or? No. No? Not at all. Uh, because, uh, first of all, those numbers really mean nothing. I can send you two masters. One is really loud and the other one is less loud, but still the less loud one reads louder on the meters. Yeah, so per because, perceptional loudness. Yeah, it's, it's about perceived loudness, but the, the LUFS system is based on uh, perceived loudness of the integrated loudness of a track. So yeah. if, for instance, if you have a really dynamic track, like with really loud choruses, but the verses and the bridges and things like that are really low in level, that takes the, the, the integrated loudness, the number, it takes it down because, I don't know, like the, 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 the chorus is, I don't know, minus six, but the breaks and things like that are maybe like minus 23. Which means it's not going to be minus six, it's not going to be minus 23, but, but the overall loudness is, I don't know, minus 12, 12 whatever. It's going to average. Yeah, but that means that the louder sections will be played louder, which is something I make use of to make it perceived louder. But actually, it's a bit of a bug in the system. Yeah. It was officially not invented for music. The, the, the love system was invented for uh, okay. for movies, uh, for television and things like that. But the music industry basically adopted it. But um, there should be a system which makes use of the integrated loudness, of course. But I think the you have the integrated loudness from start to end. You have yeah. the short term loudness uh, over a period of three seconds. And then you have the, sh uh, the momentary loudness, uh, which is the moment over 400 milliseconds out of my mind. Um, I think a system with the integrated loudness compared with, uh, of combined with the short term, uh, yeah, the short term loudness is way more efficient because the short term loudness is what is the actual loudness of the music. Okay. You don't use the numbers, but no. if, if you would use the numbers, would you use that formula to, to get a number? Uh, I really don't look at numbers. I, I have a button, I just have to press a button on my stream deck there and I can see the, the integrated loudness instantly. But that's something which I do after I did the master, but it could be any number. It could also be that I have an album which is really consistent in loudness when you listen to it. But if you look at one track, one track is minus 10, the other is minus 12 and the other is minus 8, for instance. Yeah. And that's where a lot of people go wrong. They are looking at those numbers, but those numbers really don't mean a thing. No. That's really one of the biggest mistakes people make when it comes to loudness, looking at those numbers. True that. Um, there's a big, not, it's not even a danger, but uh, Elon Musk calls, calls it the, the biggest danger to human society. It's called AI. And AI uses uh, a, a lot of numbers. What's your take yeah. on that? Uh, I do use AI, AI because, uh, for instance, uh, Ozone 11 came out, I don't know, quite recently. Yeah. And there's a function called Master Rebalance, which was already in 10, I think. Yeah. Or, or, or even in 9. M music Rebalance. Yeah, yeah, mu uh, yeah Music Rebalance or Master, no, master Rebalance. You can take out the phone yeah. 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 And back then, it was just before COVID, uh, I was doing a presentation for uh, uh, Isotope. They asked me to do a presentation, so I got a beta version of Ozone. And I think it was version 9, and it was the first version that had that master rebalance. 
And so I got the beta version, I was like, with the vocals, like, no, this is not even possible. So you can turn it up 90 dB and take it down 90 dB, which is a big, too big range, but that's something else. But then I was like, okay, this is interesting. So when I did show that to the audience during that uh, seminar, which I did, it was like, and everybody in the room was like, yeah, but that doesn't work that way. But it actually does. And since then, I don't have to ask for a remix. Be before that, if I got a mix where the vocals were a bit buried or the vocals were too loud, I just had to ask for a remix because, yeah, I could use some mid-side EQ or there are some tricks, of course, to make it louder and things like that. But you always uh, bring out other parts as well. But with the AI technology, which they use in uh, Ozone, you could simply tweak the vocals. Yeah. Of course, it's way, uh, it's not perfect, definitely no, not. But because it's still on the development, though. Yeah, it's still, that. yeah, sure. I, I assume they're still developing it and making it better and things like that. Now with Ozone 11, I haven't tried it myself, to be honest, is that in Ozone self, itself, you can um, make a full mix split into different stems. So for instance, you can EQ the drums differently than the vocals or the, the bass line or things like that. Like I said, I haven't tried that myself, to be me, honest. Me neither. But uh, it is possible. So I'm making use of it. Yeah. I can imagine. Yeah, why not? I if, if I can save a mix because sometimes you get something and it's not possible to change something in the mix because the session crashed or I don't know, it could be anything. Um, that could really be a lifesaver. But the big question is, will AI replace you in the future? No. Nope. Why not? Uh, first of all, uh, I, like I said, music is about emotions, Feel feeling that. emotions, uh, bringing that out. AI is artificial intelligence and it cannot, can never feel emotions. For instance, if you have a track where the lead synthesizer is pretty loud, but that's the main part of that song, uh, in AI, it would most likely take it down a bit because the AI thinks that that synthesizer is too loud, so it takes it down. But maybe a real mastering engineer is like, okay, this really is the, the, the lead synthesizer. It really needs to pop out. Maybe the mastering engineer makes it even louder. Could be. Um, also, feedback on a mix. How does a computer, how does artificial intelligence give feedback on a mix. It's only based when on algorithms. It's based on algorithms. So, and to be honest, uh, music is about feeling, emotions. Uh, so you spend a lot of hours, uh, days, months, whatever, on your track and you made a brilliant track, but then you send it out to a computer. Okay, fuck it up for me. <laughs> That's not how it works. No, no, so, no. And, and also like, yeah, but is it competition for you that you can do it yourself? Is no. McDonald's? Burger King, KFC, is that competition to a real restaurant? No. Do you really think they worry when there's a really great restaurant and there's, the, there's a McDonald's next to it? Do, they re do you really think they worry about it? Oh my God, there's a McDonald's next to it. That's not how it works. No, I can imagine. Actually, uh, I think I got more work because of those services and those plugins and things because in the end they find out that like, okay, it sounds okay, but there is something missing if I listen to this track compared to my own AI master. Then they're like, okay, but what's the difference then? Is the difference perhaps uh, you're working in a hybrid situation or...? Maybe. There is something about analog which you it's cannot not, always... It's not the same. It's not P the same. Period. Now, there is something about analog. On the other hand, I also do quite a lot of masters without any analog gear. To this, this morning, I made a Facebook, uh, Instagram post about just that. I was working on a track and it just didn't work to go analog. So I just used plugins because it needed to stay clean. It was a piano, piano yeah. track. Okay. So in that case, yeah, I just used some really clean, really transparent plugins. I think we need to stop uh, uh, com comparing the hardware to a plugin, yeah. and uh, we need to stop with emulating things. Or yeah, but even then, if you emulate something, let's say you emulate a Fairchild 670 compressor, if you have like six or seven of those next to each other, they will all also. sound different. Because they will never sound the same because of tubes. I don't know the transformer which is uh, dried out or. Uh, 
a combination of capacitors, tubes itself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it could be anything. So they all sound different. So why? How do you want to emulate something to make it perfect to something? Yeah. The the funny thing is that I uh, once saw an uh, interview by Andrew Sheps, and he said. Uh, he was printing a mix in the morning, mm -hmm. and it did sound different in the yeah, afternoon. Yeah, the same here. If I have the the fair ch the, the fairy mood compressor that I use here, uh, it sounds different in the morning than in the afternoon or in the evening uh, when it's on all day. Uh, also, I have to make use of that. Uh, sometimes I I have to do a master, and I did the mastering. I don't know, like at nine in the morning, and I use that compressor, for instance. And if I have to do a remaster or I have to do the radio edit or whatever, I always look, no, no kidding, I look at what time did I do the master. And around the same time, I do that master because of then the temperature, so the sound, is pretty much the same. But even then, if you really, really look, listen closely, you could maybe hear a difference. If, if Though you, the differences are so small that nobody hears it. If you would do a null test, it does not exactly no. know. No, because it's it's analog, it's always moving. It could yeah. also be the voltages which are higher. If the sun is shining, my voltage is higher because I'm running on solar panels since 2012. And then the voltage is higher. Right now the voltage is 200, yeah, something like 240 volts. But it could be that it's higher, or maybe if there are some heaters on or whatever, that it's lower. That also changes the sound. <laughs> so. Even the sun changes my sound. <laughs> <laughs> so you build a lot of gear you, uh, yourself. Yeah, sure. But, but uh, and also a lot of uh, your studio you did uh, yourself, most everything. Mm -hmm. What's the most precious tool you have in your studio? Um, my speakers, because without them I couldn't do my mastering. Yeah, yeah. The, the room itself the, the combined with the speakers, yeah. because. I also don't believe in having really brilliant speakers uh, putting in putting them in a room which is not uh, fully treated. So it's always a combination. So the room and the speakers is what 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 makes the monitoring system. Yeah. So we know a guy, Mark, mm -hmm. and uh, he once said to me, "I rather uh, would master on my BM6 in a treated room than on uh, BMCs or whatever in a non-treated room." True. Yeah, because you could have speakers like a million euro, million dollar speakers and it still sounds like shit because the room itself. The funny thing is I, I also like high-end hi-fi and a couple of weeks ago I was uh, going to such a really high-end hi-fi fair and mostly old men listening to, no kidding, 100 euros, uh, 100,000 euro speakers each. <laughs> and cables of 10,000 euros and you name it, like really expensive stuff. But I always think it's funny that they all have that in untreated room, rooms. Uh, fun fact, the, the year before that, that was, I was also there and Elko Grim uh, from Grim Audio yeah, yeah, was yeah. doing a seminar there as well and he knows a lot of things about audio, uh, electronics, but also about acoustics and how speakers work in a, in a room because they have the, the Grim speakers, of course. Yeah. And he was doing a seminar for those high five freaks and he was telling and showing them some things like this is what happens in an untreated room, this is what happens in a, uh, a room which is treated and he, he was showing and uh, things all about acoustics and things and I don't know like maybe 80% of all people in there were like okay so I don't have to spend 10,000 euros on a power cable to make it sound better, I have to spend some money on acoustical treatment. They had no idea. Uh, so it's way more important than... Do you think like uh, cabling uh, is a big difference in the no. no. No, well, that's not completely true. Um, yeah, but I'm hearing stories about yeah. uh, oxygen-free copper. No. Uh, it's partly bullshit and partly science, yeah. which is basically how it works. All my cabling is done with Grim cabling. Uh, back then, like seven or eight years ago maybe, I was uh, changing all my cabling at once. I had, I don't know, brand A on compressor A and brand B on uh, EQ B and I had all kinds of brands and different types, different lengths. I, I re simply replaced all my cabling with Grim cabling at once. And I was like, okay, so this is the difference. But that was the sum of all cabling yeah. combined with each other and that really made a difference. It really sounded more open, more transparent, better, simple as that. 
But for, for some that is at home and listening to good music? No. Sure, there's a difference between uh, 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 a one euro cable and a 50 euro cable. And that's mostly mechanical things because the one euro cable is really thin, no shielding, things like that. Yeah. So it will most likely not sound different, but uh, um, it would break sooner or uh, you get more uh, interference from, I don't know, like your Wi-Fi yeah. or these kind of things, like more like noise and things like that. But the sound itself most likely will not change. No, no, no. I do have pretty thick and shielded cables and things like that. Also, my, all my power cables are shielded power cables. And it's not because it sounds better, because that's bullshit. But the thing is that in a mastering environment with hardware, all the cabling is running next to each other. So there's a power cable running next to an audio cable. I try to avoid that as much as possible, but there are simply uh, things where it's simply impossible to have your power cable here and your audio cable here. So with the shielded power cable, Doesn't when, matter. I don't know, the, the neighbor next door turns on whatever the heater, it could be that there's a pop or some noise or whatever, and that shielding uh, prevents that from going out of the cable into my audio puff. Yeah. So it's not not like it sounds better, but it's a combination of all that shielding, which is more like uh, peace of mind. Yeah. Does it really matter? I don't know, but it's more like peace of mind. I don't want a master to be ruined because the neighbor turned on an electrical yeah, like heater. Like I said before, I don't think it uh, really affects the sound, but uh, no. it affects uh, things like pops. And yeah, 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 yeah. Could be that the noise floor is slightly less prominent. Or would, would we hear that? No. No. Uh, there is a difference with speaker cables. Tell me. To a certain de degree. It, it, if you have really thin speaker cables with the BMWs, uh, there's a power uh, amplifier, uh, a Hypex Encore amplifier of 400 yeah, watts each. They, they cannot transport. They simply cannot transport. Bec and also, it could also be that because uh, the, the wires themselves are running next to each other, that you get capacitive, uh, capacitive function. So it's basically a capacitor which you put in parallel, which means you lose some high frequencies. Or even a... Uh, uh, yeah, because a, a capacitor is a low-pass uh, filter and it yeah, could take away some of the high frequencies. So it could be that a cable with less capacitance simply sounds more open, more fresh, because it doesn't have that low-pass filter of the cable <laughs> itself. Uh, so there is some technical things which make a difference, but to a certain degree. Uh, speaker cables of 10,000 euros with all kinds of boxes and um, studs on the floor so that it doesn't touch the floor. No kidding, they have specific studs to put your cable on so it doesn't touch the floor because it could resonate, your cable really? could resonate. And, but that's bullshit. That's the other side of the story. Okay, uh, it can resonate, but how low would you go in hertz? Like, like 18 hertz? Yeah, or? but what do you want? So yeah, resonate <laughs> because it's the cable. It's just moving electricity, basically. It's moving oh, electrons. resonating on the floor. No, not not the physical resonance. No, the the uh, the electrons could no, resonate. No. That's <laughs> yeah. physically impossible. Yeah, it's, it's impossible, and that's what I always think funny is funny when I go to these fairs. I always the only thing I really believe in is power conditioning. In Europe. We are lucky to run on 240 volts because at uh, 240 volts you need less amperage to get the same amount of wattage, yeah. basically. And in the USA or other countries that run at 110 volts, you need more amperage, which also means uh, the power conditioning needs to be more consistent as well. And also the power network, the power grid in the Netherlands especially is simply good. Yeah. Well, nowadays with all the solar panels and things, it's a bit more of a problem. Uh, uh, but we, still, like the US, we don't have poles uh, that, that no. will be burned down and half cities no, without no, electricity. Yeah. If we have a power down, it's maybe an hour. Yeah. And that happens once every couple of years. Yeah. So, uh, also with lightning, a light when the lightning strike is there, sure, it might save a bit of your equipment. But do you really think that? I don't know, like 
Furman, which I also have there, did you, do you really think that it will save the equipment from burning down when there's a lightning strike in the roof? Uh, Any I, idea? I hope the so. The complete building will, <laughs> will be burnt so. down. I no, it so. will not. Yeah, it might help like 20% maybe. Yeah, yeah. Know. Yeah. You're exposing yourself as being a technical nerd. And, yeah, uh, yeah. A little bit. A little bit. I don't mind. Yeah. Um, but then you were a mixing producer, a DJ producer, you became a mastering engineer, yeah. and then came the next step. Yeah. Dutch audio. Dutch audio, yeah. Uh, I was already making equipment for my studio, and uh, somewhere in 2015, I think it was, um, I was looking for a master console, but I couldn't find anything that suited what I needed. So it was like, okay, then I'm going to build it myself with relays and things like that. So I built my own master console, more like a one-off. But then I posted it online and I got a lot of response like, okay, that's cool. If you are ever going to build more of that, I, I want to buy them. And yeah, I was like, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that because it's too much work and I have to do it all by hand and things like that. And um, But then I got so much response, I was like, yeah, maybe I should do something with that. So I started up uh, Dutch Audio and I started making mastering consoles and monitor controllers, but in the beginning just mastering consoles. And now it, it slowly evolved into uh, insert computers, which is a mastering console, but you can control it with a VST or a U plugin. So you make all the settings on the console itself. You simply press the buttons and insert gear, change the order, enable, disable, mid-side, parallel processing, input, output gains, whatever. And you just do that on the front panel, but in the background you have a plugin running. So when you save your session, Awesome and you reopen it again, bam, all of a sudden, your complete Amazing. session is back. Amazing. In safety in your session. Yeah, so but uh, as, as seeing guys, I was in uh, Würzburg uh, by Chris uh, Jones, mm -hmm. Peak, uh, Peak Studios, and he was making photos, uh, saving uh, yeah. separate <coughs> sessions, and now it's all done in, in one. Yeah, It's a really true. amazing project. Yeah. Is, are you the only one that has this? or This is that way, exactly. Yeah, with only one. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So you wait, right now you have the IC 1.1, which is an 8 insert, uh, one, one U 19 inch rack unit. Pretty basic, though it has input and output gain and mid side. Uh, and then uh, recently we also launched the IC 2.1, which is a 2U version, uh, which is uh, pretty much the follow up of the IM 2.1 that we already had with input gain, output gain, uh, mid side, parallel processing. And in this case, it has nine inserts and a bigger display and um, yeah, all kinds of things, and like I said, you can automate it. And the plugin looks exactly like the hardware itself. It, the hardware is connected to your network, so not with USB or something like that, because if you have your computer in another room and you're using USB cables, yeah, that will cause problems because it will be too long. So in this case, we, the, the software developer was like, yeah, uh, we're not going to use USB. We're going to use an Ethernet connection, so a network connection. So the unit is connected to the network, and when you open the plugin, it scans for those units. Even if you have multiple units, it will all open in the same unit or in the same plugin. And you can also make use of snapshots, which are presets within a preset. So yeah. if you have an album uh, with 10 tracks and you're going to record it in real time, you can switch between the tracks with the chain if you want to by That's using those snapshots. Automation. So automation. So snapshot one is insert one, two, four, six and mid sides with, I don't know, 0.3 dB of width. Track two has only one insert, but with mid side and some parallel processing. Track three has something else, and it's simply, you you don't have to press buttons, you can automate that, so that yeah. you can... Amaz amazing, but, yeah. but this machine is specifically for mastering. No. No? Uh, actually, the first unit we sold back then uh, was sold to a mixing studio in London. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Not even a mastering studio. So I was also in the beginning, I was thinking like, okay, this is for mastering, but it, they are used in quite a lot of mixing studio environment as well. Also because uh, a lot of those mixing engineers want to go analog and they have a chain just like a mastering engineer has an analog chain. And they're like, yeah, but I don't want to use 
the same chain over and over again. I just want to switch order and things like that. And that's why they also use yeah. a mastering console. Which oh, really? is not just a mastering console, but also for other environments. Yeah. Great, so. great, great. Out of all the things you do, yeah. being Dutch Audio, being the Goose Mastering, uh, what do you think the most fun is? Both. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I really like music. And the cool thing with mastering is that you are working uh, with all kinds of music. And then uh, all of a sudden you hear a track, you're like, wow, this is so good, this is great. And I'm working on it. And what I really like about it is that you're working in the background. So you're walking down the street and you're walking down the shop and you hear some music playing there, which is a track you mastered. Yeah. And that's what I really like about it, being in the background. Uh, you're not the artist, you don't have to promote yourself like, yeah, I'm the mastering engineer who did that. No, I just work in the background. I just do my job, basically. I just make the music sound great, do the technical stuff which is involved. And the artist is the artist. They are the one that are out there. In the past you were the artist, but that yeah. role is not suitable for you anymore. No, no, I left that behind. It's, It was good back then, but now it's... I'm not an artist. It's part anymore. of the journey. Uh, yeah, the menu yeah, yeah. It really helped me to get the vision of what an artist wants. And I see uh, artists doing tours and things like, okay, I know that feeling being on tour, going to that place, going to that place. Uh, Jealous sometimes? No, not at all. Me neither. No, no, definitely not. No. So, <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I really like being in the background now. Yeah. And it's the same with the mastering consoles, with the mastering products. Um, Billy Eilish is mastered using a Dutch audio console, for instance. <laughs> and I think that's cool. So, yeah. I love it. Yeah, love these it. kind of things. Is so. there any uh, mistaking uh, confusion with Dutch and Dutch audio? Um, not really. Uh, fun fact is that the name Dutch audio is something that I came up in, I don't know, 12 years ago, maybe even longer. I so I way before Dutch. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. That's <laughs> the reason why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, you also went to Renzo, to Renzo for Intake, yeah, yeah. and I don't know, like one and a half year ago, to I went to the Dutch and Dutch factory, Offers factory in Rotterdam, which is pretty nearby here, and yeah, so we know each other as well. Yeah. So yeah, and I met um, uh, Martijn. Is it Martijn? Yeah, Martin. Yeah, Martin. I met him once at, uh, before, I think it was not even released yet, the eight Cs, uh, at uh, the Musique Messe back then in Frankfurt. Yeah. I was talking to him like, yeah, okay, cool. And I listened to them like in a really noisy environment. So I already heard, already heard them back then. And I was pretty impressed. So, yeah. In your career, what's the most impressive moment you experienced? It's a 25-year career, it's not an easy question. Most impressive. Uh, what I really liked, and I had no idea back then, uh, is the Jeugd van Tegenwoordig, uh, Sterrenstof. Yeah, That's yeah. a track that I mastered as well. Really? And it's a funny story. It, it's too, too long to explain, but... In a nutshell. In a nutshell, I was on a holiday, but that album needed to be mastered. And back then you had an internet connection, of course, but not as fast as now. So Bas, the producer, uh, set up a WeTransfer, which was just launched back then, I think. And he sent over the files and he went out with the guys to have a drink, to celebrate that the album was done. I was coming over to the studio the day uh, from my holiday to master at least a couple of songs, including Sterrestal for that album. And, um, but something was wrong with the transfer, so I didn't have the files. So in the morning I called him up like, boss, something went wrong. But he had too much alcohol in his blood, so he had to go by train uh, from Amsterdam to Rotterdam Central Station. And so at the back of Rotterdam Central Station, I picked up a USB stick. <laughs> I still have it. <laughs> and I took the songs with me on that USB stick. I did the mastering and okay, I had no idea that it was going to be such an evergreen. But usually I don't go to um, uh, 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 lounge parties of albums. Sometimes I do, but back then I also went to the to the release party of that album. And Sterrestoff was already out for, I don't know, like a month or something like that. And when they played Sterrestoff, it was quite a big venue in Amsterdam. It really exploded. I was like, okay, this is a track that I mastered. But it was so intense to see that yeah. because it was a track that I mastered, but 
because I was working in the background, you had no idea, but it was really bam. And it was pretty cool. I did the engineering yeah. work on tracks and uh, I, I, I listening in venue. Yo, did I really do that? <laughs> that experience, yeah. uh, it, it, it's probably been one of the most uh, yeah. wonderful you, you, you can Yeah, experience. for the rest, like I said, I'm working in the background. I do have a playlist on Spotify uh, with a selection of tracks that I mastered over the years when, I, the, when there's something on, coming out. Uh, I will simply add that to that playlist so that you have an idea of the music that I mastered. And it's also a cool playlist to listen to as well because it's really eclectic. It's really all kinds of styles, all kinds of music. And yeah. Talking about a career of 25 years, you said uh, I have a playlist of uh, the tracks I did. Uh, with a career of 25 years, a lot did change technically, but also uh, the way you approach things and the way you finish things or? Yeah, definitely, especially the last couple of years. Uh, back then, I, I don't know, two or three years, I delivered two types of masters. One was for streaming, which had a maximum peak of 1 dB or minus 2 dB, depending on the situation, and one that was a regular release, which was peaking at minus 0.3 or something, something like that. But now the default master that I do is a streaming master with a maximum peak of minus one or depending on the situation, a little bit lower or a little bit higher, really depends. It's not like a fixed number as well. And that's the default master now. It's the same with 24 bits back then. All masters were 16 bit. Now it's 24. I just deliver 24 bits masters nowadays. 44? Because all, all the uh, distributors support 24 bits except for CD baby. They just support 16 bit, 16 bit for some reason. So sometimes like once every two or three weeks, I get an email from a client like, okay, could you also send me the 16 bit masters? For the rest, everything is 24 bits. 24 bit, 44? Uh, I, deliv I deliver 24, 44, but also depending on how the mix was sent in. So for instance, if it was 24 uh, bit, 48 kilohertz, I also deliver the 48 kilohertz mods. So 48 and 44.1 in that case. So. Talking about uh, this thing, I got a new thing coming up. Mm -hmm. Chris Jones also participated in this. Would you master my beat? Master your beat? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure, why not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna take a look at that. Mastering my beat, awesome job. Anything left to say? Um, don't overthink it. Just make your music. Just go ahead. If you have unfinished projects, just finish it up. It could be the best song for anyone else that listens to it for the first time. Could be like, yeah, this is a song which I don't like. Just finish it, release it, and that's it. And of course, let me master it. <laughs> <laughs> We'll link his uh, company in the description down be below. I want to thank you for watching. This episode is done. See you up in the next one. Bye-bye. Cheers. <laughs>